Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carrie Tupa. I'm with the Texas Workforce Commission. I'm here today with Ilsa Paulette uh, from Allies and Lecester Johnson uh, from Academy of Hope. Uh, and I want to welcome you all to today's session regarding equity innovations in adult education. I want to give a special thanks to Judy Mortrude from CLASP who put this session together. Uh, unfortunately, was not able to be with us today. Uh, so we hope to recreate her vision uh, with our conversation today uh, related to adult education innovations. I do want to mention um, the uh, Slido app. Uh, hopefully some of you have already heard about this in some of your other sessions. You can join via the South by Southwest EDU app or at slido.com, um, hashtag South by Southwest EDU and select our room for today, which I believe is 12AB. Here you'll be able to submit questions um, that we will review when we start having an open discussion later on in the session today. So I want to give uh, a little bit of background about our session here. And I want to just do a quick show of hands in the room. Who in the room is a part of or works directly with Title II adult education and literacy? So I see a few hands here. So I'm going to give a, a little bit of background. Uh, so those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with Title II adult education and literacy have a good framework about what we're talking about today. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, taking a look at uh, some of the most recent research available um, in this particular study, a 2012 assessment from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development found that 35 million adults have low literacy, 58 million adults have low math skills. And when we say low skills, we're meaning that they have skills that are not strong enough to be able to effectively function in society, get good jobs, support their families, be a part of civic engagement. The types of services and work that happens in adult education and literacy is to support these individuals building those skills so that they can effectively function in society. But the, the challenge isn't just limited to low basic literacy skills, low basic math skills, but also uh, problems achieving in technology-rich environments. Again, research shows that only about 33% of adults have a high enough level of proficiency to utilize digital devices in a way that um, they can effectively, again, function in today's jobs, in today's workplace, and even things like getting a job, being able to apply to a job online, being able to send an email. More importantly um, is the fact that even though more individuals are accessing uh, education, accessing higher education, that doesn't always mean that these individuals are successful. Uh, one of the biggest um, criticisms of all the Achieving the Dream work was that while more students were accessing higher education, there wasn't enough of a change in the way that those students were functioning in higher education to uh, show growth in the way those uh, individuals were moving towards <coughs> degrees, certificates, things of that nature. Um, this uh, particular graph highlights educational attainment of adults 25 years and older by race and ethnicity. Uh, obviously still a very large prevalence in um, particularly in the minority community, but for individuals completing high school and moving on into some college, but also that associate's or bachelor's degree to be able to compete in today's job market. So for all of us on the stage here, this is a, a, a challenge that we're particularly passionate about and that we're working on new ways of helping individuals not just access higher education, not just access adult education, but also succeed mm -hmm. so that they can move towards um, being more successful. The type of work that we're going to talk about today is particularly framed around work that's happening in what's called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Adult education is a service that is funded under Title II of this act. And in 2014, a new, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, the new act was signed into law. Previously, it had been the Workforce uh, Innovation Act of 1998, or as most of us referred to it as WIA. The big difference in these two acts is that whereas WIA was primarily focused on kind of high school equivalency as the ultimate goal for a participant, once they got that, they had achieved all, 
WIOA really expands that into um, what, does a, what happens for a participant after they get that high school equivalency. What is the next step that happens for that participant? Is it participation in post-secondary education and training? Is it um, employment, better employment, wage gains, transition to post-secondary for a higher degree? So WIOA really kind of reshapes the expectation of what we're expected to do with these adults but again, that just lays the need for us to be more creative about help, how we help adults not only access the services that we offer, but succeed in those services. Something else that's very important to understand about WIOA is that WIOA essentially um, collapsed a lot of the services that were being provided under WIA into more of a structured and aligned set of services so that an individual who has a variety of needs, be it not just education needs, but supportive service needs, um, vocational rehabilitation needs, should ideally, under the premise of the law, have services that are more closely aligned so that they can access all of those different needs to be successful. But again, the key there is integration of services and having services that an individual can access um, without having to go to multiple different places to, um, to get them, having kind of a, a, a one-stop shop to be successful. But another critical piece of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is this idea of career pathways. So helping an individual that has low basic skills not just get job training, not just get a job, not just get a better job, but get job training in the context of building those basic skills for more long-term success. So thinking back to the challenges with low literacy, low math, low digital literacy, um, having a model that really helps these individuals move forward and move upward in society to better support um, themselves and their families. This idea of career pathways um, has been one that's been going on for some time prior to um, the enactment of the new legislation. But again, WIOA really helped solidify for a, a lot of us that were doing this work into law to provide, again, a more um, robust framework to, for us to be able to better support our students. And new and emerging research out of Career Pathways really highlights the fact that Career Pathways participants in relation to individuals that aren't a part of a, um, a more robust integrated system not only make more foundational skills gains, so make more gains in that reading, that writing, that math, that literacy, but obviously completed more college credits, earned more entry-level credentials, completed training-related credentials, attained higher wages, um, and had a positive employment and earning outcomes. So again, it's really um, kind of creating this service delivery model that doesn't just consider the individual's basic skills needs, but their needs overall and their needs more long term to support that transition into uh, employment. So what I want to do is I want to move um, to, uh, over to Liz Hester, who's going to talk about what's happening at the Academy of Hope, which is a, uh, char an adult charter school um, related to uh, adult education and career pathways. Great. Thank you, Carrie. So Academy of Hope. Academy of Hope is an adult public charter school in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a relatively uh, unique concept, not, not new. The very first adult charter was founded in uh, D.C., the Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School, which is an adult public charter school in Washington, D.C. And D.C. has been pretty uh, forward-thinking and progressive in using charter dollars to fund adult education. In fact, across, there are some states that actually uh, forbid the use of uh, charter dollars to support adults. So we're in a really unique situation. And when we were talking um, um, earlier um, in, the, in the green room, um, you know, D.C. is a, just a unique environment for education um, uh, really unique in that the number of charters and the lack of a uh, true community college system in the district. So, so keep that in mind when I talk about adult charters, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about how that works um, there. But Academy of Hope. So Academy of Hope was founded in 1985 as a community-based organization to serve adults with low literacy and to help adults to obtain their high school credential through uh, taking, by taking the GED exam. Uh, we serve over 500 adults a year. Um, 
in, uh, through our services, and we provide uh, core services in adult basic education, so those foundational skills in reading, writing, and math. We also help adults to prepare for a high school credential, and we have two pathways to a high school credential. The National External Diploma Program, which is a competency-based program. It is, there are 70 competencies that adults have to demonstrate mastery of, and they get a high school uh, credential from a partner school that we work with. And then, of course, most uh, folks know about the GED. So you sit for an exam, you pass uh, the sections of the exam, and you get a high school equivalency. We also uh, provide uh, college transition and college prep uh, for adults who are interested in continuing their education. In fact, when adults come to us, we tell them this is the first step. So getting the high school credential is the very first step, and continuing on to additional training really is what we're trying to help them do to keep moving and move forward. Uh, we do some digital literacy, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of our career pathways programs, uh, which is new for us. We're, we're just getting into that. Um, a little bit about our learners. On average, adults are coming in reading at a sixth grade level or below. Uh, we have a significant number of people who are at the beginning literacy level, so they're beginning readers, so we're really starting from the, the beginning with them. And of course, math is the, the area where most of our learners struggle. They're coming in at a fourth grade or below. Uh, so most, what that would look like is most adults coming into our program uh, are really struggling with adding and subtracting of whole numbers. So one plus one, two plus two. Uh, so we've, we've got a significant portion of our adults who are doing that, who are coming in at those low levels. And then I've added a, just a, a small demographics. Uh, we do ha have, a, I think, a pretty significant um, youth population. Uh, overall, it's 14%. Um, and that's at 18 to 24 uh, opportunity youth group. Um, these adults actually have two locations. We have a, one in a, a site in Ward 5, if you know DC, um, and a, a district a school in Ward 8. One of our schools has a younger population. Uh, the average age of the adult we serve is uh, 31. So, and our oldest uh, graduate was 75. So we've got the huge, you know, a, a, a large age span uh, at our school. And you know, we've often been asked, you know, do you think you need a separate program for your younger uh, students? Um, and what we've learned, and even our, our students have shared with us, they like being in the intergenerational classes. I mean, there's a lot of richness that happens with that, and some of the young folks um, that we talk to tell us that they don't want to go back to high school. They'll get in trouble again. You know, the things that got them out, um, if they get in with too many of their friends, it may not work out as well. And uh, just a couple of other things. What drives an adult back to school, at least for Academy of Hope? Most adults tell us that they couldn't help their child with their homework, and that usually happens right about fourth grade. And that was an eye-opener. Not that the adults that we've served uh, have not valued education, but you know, if they've started working, they've gotten on with their lives, um, but it is when that child brings home that fourth grade homework that it is, one, it's a source of shame uh, because they can't help them, but also it's, oh my gosh, I really need to get this. If I'm going to be an example for my child and I'm pushing them to finish their high school uh, credential, I need to do it for myself. And then of course there's the economic reason. Without a high school credential, they're working these long cycles of low-wage jobs and, are hard, and even with some of the entry-level jobs, it's difficult without a high school uh, diploma. So that's what drives people back. So we've had a long history, Academy of Hope. Uh, we were doing our work, we're a community-based organization, and this topic is about equity. You know, why make this transition to charter? Because it, it was a major transition for us. Um, I would say we, you know, we're doing good enough work uh, that we could uh, get by, but we were also barely surviving. So it was really about long-term sustainability first, making it to charter. So we're raising every penny of our budget every year, but also, you know, thinking about, you know, where do we want to go as a school? Um, and what are our goals in helping our learners to continue to progress? And the board and staff, we came together in 2011, sort of looking at the environment. It really was a confluence of events. 
you know, during that time, there was a lot of conversation about career pathways and these integrated models. We could barely do the basic model, right? We had a large volunteer corps to do this work. Um, and there were, we were a staff of about 12 and the students of four to 500 using a volunteer corps to do it. The most committed volunteer corps I've ever seen. I got there in 2006 and I, I will tell you that I thought, you know, as an educator coming out of a K-12 system and some of the more um, uh, formal systems that there's no way you can do this work with the volunteer corps. And I have to say um, that changed my mind. The right training, the right people, they can absolutely support that. But uh, so the, what, what was happening? We had, um, you know, we did a strategic plan and really looked at what we wanted to do for learners and deepen the services and how are we going to do this. There was a national move to the integrated models and what are we going to do to get these integrated models going. We had a strong fundraising engine, but we certainly didn't have an engine that would get us uh, to where we needed to go. And then there were major changes with the GED and the National External Diploma Program lining up, aligning with the Common Core. And that was a very different program than the 2002 GED. Uh, and it was deeper learning and a lot more that we, where we would really need professional teachers in the classrooms to do that. Um, so we made the tough decision in 2014 to go ahead and took us a year to do this. We started in 2013 and we made the transition to charter. And so what happened with that? So you've got a before and after picture in front of you of what, what it was like. So if we look at staffing, we had 18 full and part-time staff, and that included some of our um, interns. We used AmeriCorps interns, so that number would drop, you know, um, in the fall. So inconsistent funding. Uh, 40 to 45 volunteers or more uh, running uh, our programs and limited support services. So our teachers and volunteers were really dealing with some of the social issues that our adults are coming in. Many of the adults that we're serving are really uh, struggling with housing, uh, food insecurity, any insecurity you can think of when you're living in poverty, our adults were walking in the door with that. And we were trying to resolve those issues with uh, volunteers and you know, very small staff, and we didn't have the support services. Budget at that point was 1.2 million, and then we were in a facility, uh, we were in an apartment community, 10,000 square feet, but we had teachers scattered across the property and uh, apartments and one space with about 6,000 square feet of continuous space where we did our programming. So even if we wanted to scale up to the workforce programs that we really wanted to do, we didn't have the space to do that. We make the transition in 2014. Uh, we are at, I mean, significant growth. I mean, we, it's been a, uh, the last four years have been pretty crazy. Uh, 47 full and part-time staff and an adjunct faculty for our evening program. Uh, we've kept our volunteers active and have just uh, really figured out a new role for them to support in the classroom. Expanded services, um, academic support. We have instructional coaches. We have professionally trained teachers in the classroom now. Uh, a student support team of five. So these are case managers who are working with students, uh, with our adult learners. Um, from the moment they walk in, doing a, um, an assessment, we use a self-sufficiency matrix, really trying to see what level of crisis, because all of our learners are in crisis when they're walking in the door at some level or another, and really trying to sort of triage those issues through our case management services. And then we're now in a place where we are really starting to um, get our career training up with three areas that we've targeted, which are hospitality, health, and then office administration. And then we're, our current budget is uh, $5.7 and across two locations, we're now in 41,000 square feet of, um, of space, uh, instructional, proper instructional facilities to do the work that you need to do. Um, I will say as a trained teacher, as a teacher who walked into a community, and I've worked in community-based organizations, anytime you have to make a decision between you know, a classroom set of books or do I keep a teacher? You're in a tough spot, right? <laughs> you should not have, those are just not decisions that you have to make. And so making this transition to charter for us, although it was a hard uh, decision to make, and it's been tough over these last four years, I, I tell people we are a 30 year old startup uh, because we just <laughs> entered a, you know, a different system and there are different requirements for that. So how are we doing? Um, anyone who tells you improved resources 
don't improve your outcomes or lying. Uh, we've been able to, at this point, we're, we've seen a 46% increase in our student progress. That's the academic progress. Um, we've had uh, GED pass rate. It was not this high in 2014. Um, and 85% of our students are able to pass the full GED. Again, professional teachers, a new use of volunteers, and also instructional coaches supporting our learners. And then we've got employment up. Uh, for the grad, uh, for the students that we're serving. So it's made a huge difference for us to have these additional resources. Uh, there are trade-offs in going into uh, this system, but looking back and sort of the pain that we've gone through over the last few years, talking to our teachers and the staff that have made this transition with us, we wouldn't change it. We need the resources. And I think what it's, what's happened for us we, are, we were doing good enough services. Mm -hmm. We got people in, we provided access, we provided the basic services, and now we're able to move to that next level of service for our learners and really look at the supports that each learner needs to be successful and also the career pathways and deepening the services that we're able to offer our learners. Good afternoon. Um, I am going to address this topic of equity in adult education by um, looking at how the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act that Kerry um, shared about at the beginning of this presentation um, and evaluating how it promotes equity for some students and how it might disadvantage other students. So really being a little critical about the WIOA Act and maybe challenging some of the assumptions. Um, I work for a nonprofit organization called Allies um, based in Silicon Valley, California. We're the Alliance for Language Learners Integration, Education and Success, uh, and our mission is to support English learner adults in achieving success in career, college and community. Um, so we are a coalition of service pro ESL providers and other service providers, and we work on collaboration and partnerships within the education system between ESL providers. In California, um, the major ESL providers are the community college system, and the adult schools who are funded uh, through the K-12 public um, education. And then there's a whole group of nonprofit organizations that also offer ESL classes, such as refugee resettlement agencies, libraries, um, faith-based organizations who all offer ESL. So we work on collaboration within that sector. Uh, we also look at how the education sector aligns with um, other sectors like workforce development, that would be the Title I, uh, WIOA programs, um, and social services. Um, you all know the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, well, what happens in California um, does not stay in California. <laughs> um, about one third of um, California residents are foreign born. Um, you'll notice that I'm one of them. Um, and that is a project, that's a demographic projection of what will happen in the rest of the 49 states. Right? We are demographically ahead uh, of the other states. Uh, in some regions in California, Santa Clara County, where I live, um, that percentage is up to 43% of the population are immigrants and refugees are foreign born. Um, so we're really looking at how the adult education system works or doesn't work for immigrants and refugees. Um, an estimated 600 million individu individuals in California are limited English proficient. So that's a huge number, a huge population to serve. Um, and right now, California's adult education system is going through a major reform called AEBG, or the Adult Education Block Grant. Um, that's a three-year-old program that mandates uh, collaboration and partnerships between community colleges and the adult schools. Um, so these are now mandated partners needing to be uh, at the same tables providing services for their students, providing pathways between the systems and providing transitions. Um, all with the goal of aligning to those um, WIOA outcomes. Um, so aligning WIOA Title I, the workforce um, system, and the Title II, the adult education system outcomes is a good thing or it could be a not so good thing. It's mm -hmm. good because, um, as Kerry mentioned, um, Title II programs now needing to be accountable for delivering workforce preparation services and um, career development services, um, helping their students get to that post-secondary education and training, helping their students get to that um, employment or wage gain. That's awesome. There's nothing wrong with helping adults um, achieving success in their educations and in their careers, helping to get to that better job, that family-sustaining wage that they need. However, 
um, the adult education system, and I'm speaking particularly about the adult schools in, um, in California, have historically served everyone. They have served the parents, mm -hmm. such as the Sesta mentioned, those parents who are coming to learn English because they want to help their children in school. It's about the older adults who may not be looking for a job, but they still want to contribute to their communities. Mm -hmm. It's about the immigrants and refugees who are newly arriving in the US and they want to understand the systems. They want mm -hmm. to be engaged in their communities. They want to learn how to go to the doctor, right? And how to speak to the doctor. They want to learn how to, um, how to get health insurance or how to, get, uh, how to navigate the financial system. All those things that his adult schools historically have been able to teach are a little bit at risk with the new WIOA outcomes. Mm -hmm. If we're only looking at um, post-secondary outcomes and um, mm -hmm. career outcomes, there's a risk of losing and no longer funding those other um, services that adult education provides. So if those things matter, um, we believe at Allies that we should measure them. Um, and it's not as easy to measure things like civic participation or helping your children in school as it is to measure mm -hmm. um, somebody's wage gain or somebody's, um, somebody achieving a certificate or a diploma. Um, so what we did to address that question is we looked at immigrant integration and trying to identify what that actually means, what are all the things that go into integration of immigrants, and more importantly, how can we measure that? How can we have achievable milestones or outcomes for um, our refugees and immigrants in the adult schools? So we took, uh, we didn't start from scratch, we took the, the common definition of immigrant integration, which is linguistic integration, learning the language, economic integration, and social integration, and we've expanded that um, to include eight goal areas of integration, and you'll see them uh, on the graphic on your screen. Um, for each of those eight goal areas, we have further broken that down into strategies and supporting objectives, so that those can be milestones or pathways for students to achieve success in each of those eight um, goal areas. And then most importantly for policy advocacy reasons was looking at some metrics. How can we measure that? Um, so we have a sample set of metrics for each of those eight goal areas, uh, and we're currently advocating for some of these measures to be included in AEBG, so that California Adult Education Block Grant Program, um, to include some of these immigrant integration outcomes, so that what gets measured gets funded, what gets funded gets done, right? Mm -hmm. So if these outcomes are, um, are added to outcomes for adult education, then there will be an incentive for schools and programs to deliver those kind of, kinds of services. Um, all of that, all of these um, immigrant integration goal areas um, are obviously also in support of students achieving those um, career goals and education goals. Uh, so they're not separate from them, but they're also valid in and of themselves. Um, so we can, in in addition to a career pathway, we can talk about an immigrant integration pathway, and that's just as valid of as um, achieving that job or getting that um, next step in your education. I have one copy of our framework here um, for anyone who's interested, or maybe I should raffle it off to whoever can, <laughs> can guess my accent. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to the end of the presentation. It's also uh, available on the Allies website. You'll have the link there. Uh, if you want to take a look at the framework, you can download it on our website. Um, so now that we have this framework, what are we doing with it? As I mentioned, uh, we're active in policy advocacy. We're joined by some professional organizations in California that are actively advocating for these measures to be included um, in legislation and in policy. Uh, we're also using the framework as a key resource in our ELL Workforce Navigator pilot. Um, that's a, a state grant opportunity that we're currently working on. It's um, our governor, Governor Brown of California, has decided to spend uh, money from the 15% governor's discretionary funding under WIOA to support adult English language learners. So yay, Governor Brown, <laughs> for, making, <laughs> for making that decision. Um, so we are working with five pilot sites across California, um, partnerships between workforce development boards, mm -hmm. education systems, and their community-based organizations who offer wraparound services. Uh, and they're implementing a model of a navigator. So a person, a case manager that works with language learners one-on-one -on -one and helps them navigate the system, helps them connect 
with the services that they need to be successful. So that's one use um, of the framework uh, currently underway. Uh, we're also implementing the framework uh, with one consortium in our region, in San Jose, California, the South Bay Consortium for Adult Education. Um, so we're looking at how the framework informs curriculum, what happens inside the classroom, but also what happens outside the classroom. How are counselors, how is frontline staff interacting with immigrants? Do they have the cultural competency um, to work with these groups? Um, do they have the knowledge of other services in their community that they can refer people to? Uh, and one exciting piece of that work is what we call our reciprocal referral pilot. Um, so this nice graphic shows um, how it works. So you have um, participants in the middle of the graphic. These are our students. Um, and one thing that the consortium realized was that um, our students are someone else's clients. So we are all serving the same people, right? Mm -hmm. The students who come to our classes are clients of social services. They are clients in a refugee resettlement program. So they are, we're all really looking at serving the same people. So how can we do that better? How can we build stronger partnerships and collaborations between all who serve immigrants and refugees in our community? Um, so we are building these partnerships between the Workforce Development Agency, the Title I provider, community colleges and adult schools as organized into these uh, adult education block grant consortium, that's the Title II providers, and then a group of community-based organizations who offer services like uh, immigration legal services, much needed, important topic these days. Um, Community-based organizations who offer social services, childcare, transportation, help with applying for um, CalWORKs or SNAP um, um, programs, or who help parents become more civic, more engaged at their children's school. Um, so all of these partners working together to serve the same students, it's a no wrong door model, um, meaning that a client or a student, a participant can enter at any one of these organizations and get referred to one of the other partners. Uh, and we're trying out some systems of shared case management so that we can track participants as they, as they move um, between these different organizations. Um, because what often happens um, right now is that a teacher will say, oh, you need legal services, why don't you check out this organization? And we never know what happens to that referral. Does that person actually go to that service? Does he, he or she receive services? You know, what, what happens from that? So we're looking at shared case management systems so that we can share case note and notes and actually track those outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also, while we're testing this system of referrals, we also want to know if delivering this integrated service model makes a difference um, on the integration of people. So we're looking at that linguistic, social, and economic integration and making sure uh, if we have a cohort of participants that we can do a pretest and a post-test to measure if such an intervention, such new program delivery system actually makes a difference. So we're looking at um, linguistic testing, something that all adult schools are very familiar with, um, economic information, um, so that those are things like the self-sufficiency matrix and making sure, you know, checking some economic data. And then for the social integration, which is a little more difficult to measure, we're partnering with the Stanford Immigration Policy Lab. They have just, um, they are working on a tool, uh, on a survey to actually measure someone's experience of being integrated or not. Um, so, we're help, um, so we're partnering with them on trying out some of the questions in that tool. Um, so it's really exciting work. Um, if you want to follow along with the progress, um, I would happily give you more information or you can always check our website to, um, to find out what we learn because we're all um, learning together in this one. I'm going to pass it back over to Carrie. So now I take off my moderator hat um, and I put on my <laughs> presenter hat. Um, but I want to talk to you all just very briefly about some things that are happening uh, here in Texas um, related to this topic. Uh, I represent the Texas Workforce Commission, so we are the state agency that facilitates these WIOA um, or WIOA Title II funds uh, for uh, the state of Texas, so we have a variety of service providers across the state. And for us, um, very similar level of diversity in Texas. Uh, we serve about anywhere from 60 to 65% of our population 
that we serve in adult education is in English as a second language. Uh, for, so for us, in looking at kind of our demographic profile and the, um, the parts of the, the demographic profile that are growing, we know that if we don't find a way to serve these various skill levels and these various skill um, abilities, we are not going to have a workforce. Um, and obviously at the Texas Workforce Commission, that matters to us very much. Uh, so when our program came to uh, the work, uh, when the Title II program came to the Workforce Commission from the Texas Education Agency in 2013, um, that was a very big objective for us. So uh, we have a, a pretty uh, hefty goal um, that we are actually doing quite well in achieving, um, and that is that by the year 2020, at least 20,000 adult learners will enroll in Career Pathways programs. These are a variety of different types of programs. These are programs that lead to industry-recognized credentials, certifications, certificates. These are programs in partnerships with employers to serve incumbent employees to help those employees kind of move up in the workforce. So for us, um, we know that we have a very diverse population in Texas, but we see that as not necessarily a challenge, but an opportunity to find new ways to serve um, these individuals in our state. Something else, um, and we were, uh, Ilsa and I were talking about this a little bit before the session, um, is a population that we recognize very highly is the number of individuals that we have in our state that are from other countries that actually have high level degrees mm -hmm. or credentials or certifications from other countries. And that's a diff very different population. That's not the same as an individual who's non-literate in their native language. So for us, it's very important that all of our service providers are finding uh, unique ways to handle these different types of skills and abilities and are not using this kind of one-size-fits-all model approach um, in helping individuals. Um, obviously, uh, as Ilsa mentioned, there's you know, definitely um, some threats in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act for uh, certain populations. For us, uh, one of our main objectives right now however, is to utilize it to its full potential to ensure that we are, wherever possible, utilizing the other uh, resources that are available as a result of this act by co-enrolling our participants in other types of services so that we are truly addressing any barrier um, that a student comes in with. Lacester made a, an interesting, or she, she mentioned um, their, kind of their population, and I, it, it caused me to want to kind of stress to folks in the room that maybe aren't as familiar with adult education and literacy is we are serving um, high school dropouts. We're serving people who finished high school mm -hmm. and still have these low basic skills. Yep. We're serving individuals who never had the opportunity to go to high school. So we're serving a very broad range of individuals that come in with all kinds of barriers. And if we don't address what caused or prevented them from completing, you know, middle school, high school, et cetera, in the first place, they're not gonna be successful. So it's absolutely important to us um, that we do whatever we can to utilize all of the resources at our disposal to help that individual, but to also make sure that we are um, looking at it through a lens of not everybody needs exactly the same thing. So what are those resources and what's the right place and what's the right fit for a participant? Um, we consider very strongly our strategic plan with the, the higher education strategic plan in Texas, which has to do with per, the percentage of Texans ages 25 to 34 that will have a certificate or degree by the year 2030. For us, we see ourselves as a very critical part of this mission. Um, so you'll notice, you know, we have our 20 by 20, they've got their 60 by 30. But for us, um, we fit in very closely with this mission as we know that there is a, still a very large percentage, as I mentioned, of individuals who are completing high school but still do not have the basic skills necessary to succeed in those certificate, credential, degree-bearing programs. The other critical piece here, and if you look at that, that bottom bullet there, is the, um, the issue with student debt. It doesn't help a student if we're getting them into post-secondary we're helping them complete post-secondary, but they graduate and the job that they have is not enough to address the amount of debt they've acquired by getting there. Um, so for us, again, a very big um, issue, and particularly when we're looking at individuals who come in 
to a um, post-secondary education uh, training program needing quite a large amount of remediation, that remediation tends to cost money. So we are trying to see what we can do as a service provider that um, has services available to anybody at no charge, what can we do to fill that gap to help individuals integrate those services, proceed into their post-secondary education and training, be successful and not have um, acquired a significant amount of debt or lost their Pell funds in the process. This map um, I threw together very quickly. This represents the number of adult education or the adult education and literacy providers in Texas that are either community colleges or that are in a consortia that are aligned to a community college. The community colleges are a huge part of our service delivery model. And again, we see ourselves as a part of their service delivery model here in the state of Texas. Um, something else we were talking about beforehand was um, kind of the view of the low-skilled student, and there's been a, a multi-year struggle between kind of colleges, charter schools, adult education schools, trying to decide whose student is this, where do they belong, um, and it's, it's absolutely critical that everybody kind of sees this as their role, but works together to provide the best level of service for this participant to actually get them the outcomes that they weren't able to get or didn't have access to prior. If you think about um, the traditional quote unquote model um, for the quote unquote traditional student, so if we think of a student that completes uh, high school, gets their high school diploma, is considered college ready, that student gets to come to college, enrolls in college, completes, and either graduates or transferred. Well, historically, for the low-skilled student, the model looked more like this, where they came to a college, they enrolled, and then they were immediately deferred into remedial coursework because they didn't have the skills yet, um, or at that point in time, to succeed, all the while either accumulating debt or spending down their Pell funds. For us, um, in Texas, a huge mission right now is making sure that when a student comes to college, there is no wrong door. There's not a, this isn't for you, or you need to go somewhere else, but rather we are actually taking the time to ask, what is it that you came to college to do? What are the skills you actually need to do that? Not every occupation needs college level math. Not every occupation needs freshman composition and getting students on a pathway that's more appropriately designed for what they're actually trying to accomplish all the while considering their uh, unique needs. So for us, um, I loved uh, Elsa, what Elsa said, um, kind of this no wrong door idea. Um, that's definitely uh, an area that's, that's very important to us in making sure that we have uh, kind of aligned all of our services, whether they be community colleges, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, volunteer literacy providers in the best way possible to serve every student as best as possible. So with that, uh, I want to move into some discussion. Um, and I want to start um, by just uh, asking a few questions that um, we have, have kind of discussed and, and wanted to talk about it a little bit um, before we move into some of the audience questions. But um, Elsa, I wanted to start with you. How does y'all's approach kind of engage or draw in the type of um, individual who maybe doesn't necessarily typically have access to adult education mm -hmm. and literacy services? Yeah. Uh, I think that the key word here is trust, um, especially um, for immigrant and refugee students. There's a lot of fear right now in immigrant communities and either they don't know about the services available at community colleges or adult schools mm -hmm. or they know about them and they don't trust them. They don't want to go there and offer their personal information. Um, so for, for our allies model to work with our community-based organizations, our partners who are um, in the communities, who represent the communities, those places where English learners naturally um, have access to and that they will access, they will go to their, um, to their church or to their parish, they will go um, to a community-based organization. Um, so you, leveraging that expertise from our community partners to build trust for students so that they can understand that the adult schools and the community colleges are there to serve them, that they're often low cost for them and that they don't always collect a whole lot of personal information. That's a key element of our partnership. So really leveraging 
um, those trusted relations that community partners have. Um, I think that's a large part of um, providing real access and more than access um, equity. Absolutely. Great. Um, and Les Hester, so you talked a lot about kind of the big decision to go to a charter model. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we talked the adult charter school is definitely um, something that's fairly kind of new, growing uh, in the U.S. What do you feel or what would you kind of advise folks maybe are some of the positives of going to a charter model versus mm -hmm. what are some of the trade-offs? Yeah, so the trade-off for us, I'll, I'll start with it. What a positive are the resources. So we are pulling down. So if you go, if you look at our funding uh, streams, we raise every penny of our budget um, each year through uh, individual donors, grant writing. I mean, that's hard-earned money uh, for that. As an adult public charter school, we're able to pull down the uniform per pupil funding uh, per student. So just to give you an example, we were operating on about 2,500 to 3,000 per student um, as a community-based organization and going into the charter system, we are now at about 11,000 per student. And that is that is still below the K-12. Adult charters in the district receive 89% of the uniform per pupil funding uh, than the K-12s. We also, because we are an adult school, we aren't eligible for the title dollars like Title I funding. Very few of our students are still eligible for IDEA funding um, uh, for individuals with disabilities. So we're still fundraising. So we are getting additional funds, but we are still fundraising. That's one of the biggest uh, things for us and having the resources to do what we need to know needs to be done. I, you know, someone is saying, what's innovative about your work? And sadly, I, these are the things that should be done. We know our best practices, and we're just now able to really fully realize what we need to do to support our learners. So that's been a real positive, to be able to do what you know needs to, do, to happen. And we're now in that next stage of what do we want to do around innovation? The trade-off for us is going into a K-12 system, just the lens that's viewed. There are eight adult charters in the district, and I think I, I, I'll say over 50 charter schools total. The rest are K-12 schools. So the lens um, that's used to evaluate charters uh, and adult charters is overwhelmingly K-12. Uh, so things like seat time or, or you know, we know an adult ed that there's this you know, adults have to stop out for a while because of life changes. So really educating the charter school board uh, and the charter school authorizers, their new in this. Uh, Carlos Rosario is 22 years old, but they didn't have a large number of adult charters and they've uh, begun to grow. So that's been really difficult. Also, we straddle the fence of an educator, you know, education funding. So we, you know, uh, Elementary and Secondary Ed Act, uh, or ESA now, uh, funds um, authorized charters or used authorized charters. We also receive Title II funding through WIOA, and then each of those has their performance requirements. So we've got three frameworks that we've got to align to make sure that we're hitting our performance outcomes. So that's been a, a real challenge for us. Interesting. So I, I wanted to ask both of you, um, we've sort of talked about this idea of um, you know, the finish line and what the finish line looks like, and it's definitely different for each of our individual populations that our organizations serve. So what do you see as kind of your, what is your primary role or goal in getting students to the finish line? And then what are the things, specific things that you feel are better left to your partner organizations or other entities that you partner with? And I'll turn it over to whichever one wants to go first. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start. Uh, for us, you know, we, we do education really well. Uh, we're really strong with reading, writing, and math skills. Uh, we are now uh, going into looking at worker competencies and how do we integrate those and really doing a really strong uh, integrated program. But we do lean on our community college. Um, there's been some tension locally, uh, particularly with other areas looking at uh, adult charters to provide the adult ed piece, that we can really work in partnership with community colleges. Um, the, UDC Community College in DC has a really strong workforce program. We're starting with what we call low barrier entry career pathways, so getting people 
getting their foot in the door, but really helping to take a long view of what's next um, and providing those supports, but looking at the community college to do the, most, the more advanced training. Um, we, we made an, an early decision that, you know, we can't do the big stuff. The community colleges have the resources and how do we work with them to do that? So sort of staying in our lane of what we do really well of getting doors open, we do a dual enrollment, students are able to earn college credit, but then we do a seamless uh, handoff to the community college and working with their advisors there to ensure that students know what the next steps are and then we will um, you know, really help to, to make it easy to bridge the, the transition. And a lot of what you said resonates with me. I think that warm handoff is really important. If you mm -hmm. look at transitions between adult schools and community colleges, um, I'm gonna, I forgot what, <laughs> what okay. I was going to say it, uh, else about that. But really, the, the warm handoff and providing that service. Um, a lot of our um, partners within the Adult Education Block Grant Consortia provide bridge programs for their students. So at the adult schools, there will be classes called Bridge to Engineering or Bridge to Automotive, Bridge to Healthcare programs. So that's really a first step for some, first step for some of the students in the adult schools to, to become familiar um, with some of the language and some of the training opportunities at the college. Those have been very successful. Um, when I think about the wraparound services and the support services. Um, when we present our immigrant integration framework, that same graphic that I showed you, um, to some of our educate, uh, adult education partners, it feels overwhelming because they think, you want us to do what? You want us to provide legal services and childcare and transportation? Like how We're mm -hmm. not set up to do that. Uh, and so the answer to that question is always, you're exactly right, you're not set up to do that. Mm -hmm. You do what you are best at. You provide a high quality education for your students and then you partner with your community mm -hmm. partners that are really good at providing those other services. And sometimes it's bringing in uh, a legal service providers to present a workshop for your students. Sometimes it's a referral. Sometimes it's um, referring someone to social services so that they can ha get some assistance in accessing childcare programs if they need them. So that collaboration, that partnership can take many, um, many forms, um, but it's really about doing what you, everybody in a, in a partnership, in a collaboration, doing what they do well and referring students out for those services that they're not experts at. So um, what, what you just mentioned, uh, Ilsa is, um, if, if I were to use one word to describe adult education providers, it would be scrappy. Um, <laughs> they are the scrappiest mm -hmm. group of folks I have ever met in my life and, and can truly do amazing things to pull together resources. And I think, I know for us in Texas, and this may be the case with y'all, is you know, we find obviously certain areas of the state are much more skilled or have those relationships built a lot better than others. And so you do run across the issue where in certain areas you're doing an amazing job of providing these wraparound services, but at a state it's, it's really not equitable, it's really not aligned. Mm -hmm. um, so I know for us a big objective is to, to figure out how can we take what's working, scale it, share it, um, and formalize it without making it daunting um, so that folks still are feeling motivated to kind of provide what their unique organization provides but again, understanding that, that they don't have to do everything. Um, so I, I wanted to take a few of the audience questions, um, and I, I uh, particularly, um, and I, I apologize if I skipped your question, it's not because I don't like you, um, or I don't like the question, but we, um, with the amount of time we had, I wanted to kind of start with some um, that uh, kind of caught my attention and then move on. Um, but I wanted to look at this one that says, how can public libraries, ed tech companies, and contents providers support here? What, current situ what is the current situation and interaction? And this kind of um, alludes back to something I talked about in the introductory slide, and it's mm -hmm. this idea of the digital divide or digital equity. Um, and it is a huge barrier for our participants because while we may be able to offer the world in terms of education, they do not have the resources for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. It might just not be available. Um, you know, obviously in Texas, we have big chunks of the state where there's nothing, there's cows or goats. Um, so how can we make sure that our, our students that are accessing, um, you know, distance learning and things like that 
or working on those digital literacy skills have access to the resources that they need. Um, so I would say for us, I know in Texas, the biggest gaps tend to be internet, 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 um, and affordable internet and reliable internet for those individuals that are wanting to access resources but maybe can't go physically to a location. Um, obviously, uh, we utilize our libraries um, very heavily and have a pretty robust uh, partnership with our libraries here in the state of Texas to do things like provide a location for individuals to build those digital literacy skills, but also to access adult education and literacy services when, again, they might be working, they might have, you know, be helping their kids out after school and need a place where they can just go and access services after hours, et cetera. But I wanted to um, ask you all, um, uh, LaCester and Ilsa, what other um, places do you feel like there's kind of a gap or where these types of um, folks can, can jump in and help? Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking specifically about the digital literacy and, and one thing that comes to mind is that digital literacy should, should not be something separate or on top mm -hmm. of whatever program you are providing, whatever curriculum sh you are providing. It should be embedded into everything you do, just like when you're teaching English or any second language. Um, teaching grammar is not something standalone, separate. It's mm -hmm. something that you embed in, in whatever uh, mm -hmm. functional skills that you're trying to teach your students. Mm -hmm. So if there are ed tech companies who have figured that out, who can help build in technology into existing curriculum or enhance it, um, I think that would be a fabulous opportunity for, for collaboration. Um, libraries um, in our area are especially good at filling the gaps um, with tutoring, one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. tutoring. They often have volunteer tutors who, wor who will work on, on literacy. Um, and they often provide ESL conversation groups, for example, or um, family and children programs. They also fill in the gap over the summer when a lot of our adult schools are not in session. Uh, that's a great opportunity for our students to go to the library, bring their kids, take a conversation class, and not have that summer gap of two months between classes. So that's definitely an opportunity. But in our exp experience, it's kind of hit and miss in terms of how strongly um, the schools and the libraries collaborate. So certainly um, a lot of opportunities for deepened partnerships. And I, and I just wanted to say also, just something else that jumped out at me, we, I know we tend to find, and you all may find this as well, um, because there's not a lot of money to be made in adult education, <laughs> no one's making the resources. Um, so a lot of times the type of software, the types of resources that we yeah. have available are ancient or they Can't don't run try. on a mobile platform, which is the one thing that most of our students have. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a key. Um, but, uh, but absolutely, um, the, the digital literacy is huge. LaCester, mm -hmm. did you want to? Yeah, I, I, you guys have covered it all. <laughs> Access um, is a huge issue. I... Um, so I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I, I like this kind of next question down. What are kind of the prerequisites for a successful adult education and literacy program? How does your organization help to sustain beginning readers' motivation? Um, so with the two minutes we have, did you all want to jump in on that one? I, I will say uh, one of the things that we have found is absolutely critical is creating a safe space uh, for our learners. I, we underestimate the value of that, but when you talk to our learners in focus group, it is they feel safe to take risk in their learning. Uh, there are a lot of their educational experiences. So the majority of the learners that we're serving are individuals who dropped out. Or, um, you know, as Carrie mentioned, they have a high school diploma, but they are still struggling with basic skills. So it takes a lot of courage for an adult to walk to an adult education program. And our whole philosophy is about when the phone, when you pick up the phone, or from the moment they walk in, we have to ensure that we're going to keep them. Because there is every step of the way, there's an opportunity uh, for uh, there's a chance that this adult learner will say, I can't do this, I can't do this. So the hard work, and, and my teachers might uh, throw something at me <laughs> for saying that, it's not necessarily teaching the reading, writing, and math. It's a challenge, but it really is changing mindsets mm -hmm. and helping people to see themselves as successful learners because that's, mm -hmm. that's what will keep them there. Absolutely. So. 
Absolutely. Okay. Elsa, did you want to add anything to that? I, I agree with everything that Sester yeah. said. Believe in your students, because that may be the first experience they have of somebody believing in them. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all so much um, for being here today. Uh, obviously, I want to thank uh, Ilsa and Les Sester. Um, we uh, have, uh, I posted our contact information briefly, um, but if you have any additional questions that we weren't able to get to, please feel free to come up after the session and we'll be happy to answer. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today and a special thanks again to Judy Mortrude from class for putting the session together. Y'all have a great right. day. Thank you. Thank you.